Hello and welcome to Ag PhD. I'm Brian Hefty. And I'm Darren Hefty. Thanks for joining us today. One of the biggest insect, well, literally biggest insect problems we find <laughs> on our farm is the white grub. We're going to talk about white grubs on today's program. And we're also going to discuss white mold. It's sclerotinia stem rot or sclerotinia white mold. It's a terrible issue in soybeans and a number of other crops, but we'll talk about how to solve it today. We've also got a tough to control weed of the week and an iron talk coming up later in the show. But first, here's our farm basics. These days, it can be hard to make the math work in your soybean fields. With the Liberty Link system with Liberty Herbicide, it gets easier. A two plus bushel per acre advantage over Asgro Roundup ready to extend soybeans means at least $18 more an acre for you. Plus, lower system input costs and more complete weed control all adds up to at least $33 more an acre for your farm. That's smart math. Grow smart with BASF. During our Farm Basics time today, we're going to talk a little about farmer yield maps. When farmers are harvesting fields with modern equipment, they have the capability of mapping out what the yield was at every little spot all around the field. So they'll come up with a really pretty picture that tells quite the story. When you see areas of the field that are yielding really high and areas of the field that are yielding much less, farmers have an opportunity to address some of those issues going into the next year. Yeah, so what are those issues? Well, the big problem that we have as farmers and we look at the yield maps is we go, all right, I know I've got a problem here. I know my yield is low, but why? Well, the challenge with after harvest is there's no crop there. There are no weeds there. There are no bugs there then. We don't really know for sure why we had that problem. Yes, we can go out and do some soil sampling then and do a little site inspection, dig around a little bit and that type of thing. But otherwise, we don't have all the answers then. So one way that farmers will address these problem areas out in the field is to go do some soil testing. When they take soil samples in the good areas and then the bad areas of the fields, oftentimes they can see a correlation with certain levels of different nutrients where they're a little higher in the good areas and a little lower in the other areas of the field. Yep, another thing that farmers can identify even at this time of year or at least in the fall right after harvest, is if it's a drain tile problem. If they realize that, ooh, you know what, I think there's a drain tile line that goes right through there, I wonder if that's plugged. And then they can check that and find out if it is or not. That very well could be the problem. But again, I kind of come back to weeds, insects, diseases, those types of things in season. That's where really satellite imagery is helpful to recognize, oh, we're having a problem here. Then you can go out in season and figure that out. I kind of look at satellite imagery as getting my yield map in season as opposed to in the fall when I actually harvest. And farmers will talk a lot about, well, I need to overlap this data, my yield map, with other data that I've got from earlier in the season. And maybe that's an as-applied herbicide map for a herbicide trial, or maybe it's uh, different hybrids that they've got going on in the field. Let's see where those hybrids were at and where the high yielding spots in the field were, or it could come down to soils or other problems that they've had throughout the season. But taking that yield map data really gives, hey, here's the result. Now let's see what led to that problem along the way. Well, once again, yield maps are really important as a management tool for farmers. It helps us identify where we've got problem areas and also where the good areas are so we can compare those two. One of the problems that may pop up in fields is our weed of the week. Can you identify this week's weed? What do the top growers in the world have in common? If you had some insight into their strategies, would that help guide you moving forward? I'm Darren Hefty with Ag PhD. On Tuesday, February 19th, we'll be holding a free Secrets of High Yield Fields workshop on our farm near Baltic, South Dakota. We'll show you soil tests from some of the highest yielding fields in the world, compare them to farm averages in your area, and discuss which strategies will benefit you most. Attend the Ag PhD Secrets of High Yield Fields workshop. Register today at agphd.com. Leading the charge in strip tillage for more than a decade, the Soil Warrior brings the future to your farm today. At Estes Performance Concaves, we know how valuable your time is at harvest. That's why we designed the new XPR Concave System. The XPR System is the number one performance concave system on the market surpassing the rest in both speed and efficiency, ensuring every last grain from your field gets into your tank. Plus, 
XPR Concaves work for all row crops. No more changing concaves, meaning you have less downtime. Take back your bushels this harvest. Get Estes Performance Concaves in your combine today. If you're looking to expand your farm's grain handling, you want everything to be fast and efficient. The Quick Belt from Norwood Sales is your all-around grain handling solution. Our conveyor-based system uses an 18-inch belt in a 10-inch tube, which minimizes seed damage while moving more than 10,000 bushels an hour. That's fast enough to fill a semi in six minutes. Plus, our hood is designed to gently direct the flow of grain straight down, keeping your crop in condition. Keep your grain and your farm moving with the Quick Belt from Norwood Sales. The Guardian Air Twin Spray Nozzle from Hypro produces a twin spray pattern with air inducted droplets for superior coverage, even in dense canopies. Be effective and efficient with your spray application this season with the Guardian Air Twin. Hypro, helping you spray better. Agro Liquid line is something special. A lot of really impressive playmakers. Take a look at Sure K. This guy is an enigma. But wrap your head around the exceptionally high plant response when compared to conventional potassium sources, the research proven plant availability, plus flexible application options and mixing capabilities. Really stellar performance stats. Sure K is a true standout, and that's a winning goal on any field. Sclerotinia white mold is a terrible disease. It's one of the worst ones we've had on our farm here the last couple of years too. It can affect soybeans and a number of other crops. So today we're gonna to talk a little about this disease, why it's so bad, and what you can do to fix it on your farm. First of all, let me dispel any myth about, well, it's Liberty Link beans that are the worst on white mold, or it's Extend beans that are the worst, or it's conventional beans. That's all nonsense. There's elite germplasm going into all of these trait platforms. There's no trait platform across the board that's better on this disease than any other. Now, I'll say this too, there are no resistant varieties out there. There are some that are more tolerant, and when we look at the tolerance level of certain soybean varieties, it doesn't matter what the trait package is, doesn't matter what the maturity package is, as far as is it a late maturing bean or an early one, what really matters is the plant structure and how that plant really stands up all through the season. If we have good standability, and here's one other characteristic you may not have thought of, leaf size. If you've got smaller leaves, especially on the upper nodes, that allows for more sunlight to move down through the canopy. When we have those conditions with a good standing bean, smaller leaves up top, we end up with more sunlight down low and less white mold pressure. All right, let's talk about exactly why. Well, sclerotinia white mold can survive in soil not super long, but uh, many people will say around five years or so. And what happens is you'll end up with mushrooms that are coming out above ground. They shoot spores out. Those typically will go in through, like in soybeans, I'll just give you the example, when we have flowers in soybeans, the flowers will dry up pretty quickly and then it's in those spots that usually the infection goes in. So you don't typically see white mold before you're going to see any flowers. The white mold's going to come a little bit later in the season in almost all crops. But the reason why this disease is so bad is because it can be a real hard infection. You don't notice it super early. A lot of people say, well, I'm done, it's late in the season, and then that thing just takes off. So with this disease, it is a stem rot, sclerotinia stem rot. It's a fungal disease, so there are fungicides that have activity on it, but the problem is you've got to spray really good elite fungicides early in the season, and those are expensive. Well, you also have to get great coverage, and here's one other thing, Brian. When you talk about soybeans flowering, now the soybeans are bigger, and in a lot of cases, they've got a canopy. And if you've planted at a very thick population or they're a very bushy type soybean or they have a lot of lodging or lazy branches, it's tough to get that coverage down through there and you've got a prime environment for fungal development where it's going to be considerably cooler than it would out in the sun 
and you've got restricted air movement and more moisture. Okay, so like Darren was talking about earlier and he said, hey, it makes a lot of difference with your plant type and all these types of things. If you can get more sunlight down, you have less problem. Just think about what are the best conditions for mushrooms to grow? Well, it's when you've got that tight canopy, there's a lot of humidity, you're not getting sunlight down there. So if we have hot conditions and sunny conditions, then we don't typically have a problem with sclerotinia white mold. That's why this is much more of a problem in the northern United States and up into Canada as opposed to down south. So if you've had white mold in your fields or in area fields around you, what can you do to protect your fields? One correlation that we've seen that's been documented with a nutrient is manganese. If we're low in manganese availability, we end up typically with more white mold. If we've got really good, strong manganese availability, we often see less white mold. So that's something you could start building up uh, going into next spring, whether that's putting some chelated manganese out relatively close to where you're planting the seed, or if you get something done over the winter here, if you had the right conditions, clearly you can't if you've got snow. Well, you could also do manganese foliar. But the other thing with manganese in the soil is it's much more available as the soil pH goes down. So if you've got an 8 pH, you're, you're going to be more prone to have white mold. If you can push that pH down, usually by improving drainage and adding elemental sulfur, you push that pH down, now you're going to have better manganese availability, you should have a little bit less white mold. One other thing you can do in terms of a soil amendment is you could put out a natural fungus to try and fight against this sclerotinia. There's a product called Contans that contains a natural fungus that feeds on the sclerotia. So by putting it out, hopefully in advance of planting soybeans or even the fall after soybeans in a two-year crop rotation, to give that fungus more time to work, you can reduce the number of sclerotia and reduce the white mold pressure. There's been a lot of work done on this product over the last few years in the upper Midwest with pretty promising results. Now, one thing I would caution you on, this product needs to be frozen or kept very cool. So it's a little different than other products you handle, but if you handle it right, it's going to do a nice job for you in the field. Well, kept frozen for storage, not for use, obviously. Uh, then we talk about Cobra, use a low rate, maybe a half rate. Before flowering, you can do that in soybeans. For all crops, you better look at fungicide. I would be spraying as soon as I possibly can, so we're talking about right at R1 in soybeans and a number of other crops. Endura is the best product, Proline is a little step down. Then you go down to products like Topson and Domark that are okay, but as cheap as they are now, you could actually tank mix those and get pretty decent results. Brian mentioned R1, that's first flower in soybeans. So as soon as you're flowering, you've got to protect it with a fungicide every week to two weeks all the way through the season. And many times we'll see white mold pop up late in the season and farmers have only sprayed one shot of well, fungicide or maybe yeah, two. Yeah, but hold on there, not every week or two weeks. We're gonna say every two to three weeks is when you would want to reapply. Fungicides, we can get at least a couple weeks worth of residual out of them. To think we can stretch it to three weeks, it's possible. No, Brian, here's the challenge though, is each flower that comes out, the petals need to be protected. Well, soybeans are in bloom, really from R1 to about R5.5, they're putting out new blooms. So every new bloom that comes out is unprotected if it doesn't get hit with a fungicide. Well, so not necessarily. how long do you wanna wait? Not necessarily. So what we're looking at here is the new leaves and new stem. So that is unprotected, yes, I'll give you that. Either way, white mold is a serious problem in soybeans. It's really tough to stop. So you've gotta plan ahead. Oftentimes we're planting a lower population with a variety with known tolerance to sclerotinia white mold. And then we're treating it by putting contans out in the soil, making sure we've got good levels of manganese throughout the season and using cobra and foliar fungicides to slow it down in season. Yeah, and again, cobra is only with soybeans, not with some of the other crops. And I'd say too, variety selection is the number one thing that I'm looking for. Gotta have a great variety do that. To think that we're gonna cut planting population way down and we're gonna have dramatic impact, we have not seen that on our farm. We'll be able to slightly reduce the white mold, but it is absolutely not going to solve the problem if you cut the planting population. And now we've also taken more risk for having more weeds in there and other problems. So be careful about cutting planting population and thinking that's your, your number one solution. It's not. One other issue that we can sometimes see in soybeans is our weed of the week. Can you identify this week's weed? How can you cut farm expenses in 2019 and still yield well? 
which input expenses are just that, expenses, and which inputs will give you great weed, insect, and disease control and give you a great return on your investment. These are big questions this season, and we'll answer them at the free Ag PhD 101 Ways to Cut Farm Expenses workshops. We'll take a close look at every kind of farm expense. So if saving money is important to you, come to Ag PhD's 101 Ways to Cut Farm Expenses workshops. Registration is now open at agphd.com. There are 6,272,640 square inches in an acre. We count it. Why? Because we designed the TigerMate 255 field cultivator and 2000 series early riser planter to maximize every single one. So when you create the most level seed bed in the industry and target a nickel size area to plant a seed and never miss, you'll know in high efficiency farming, there's one name to count on, Case IH. Rethink productivity. Learn more at caseih.com slash every inch. Your planter is the single most important piece of equipment on your farm. Because without a uniform stand, you can't reach maximum yield. That's why Harvest International set out to design a planter that takes advantage of the newest innovations in planter technology. Built tough for high speed and integrated with the latest precision enhancements, Harvest International planters ensure every seed you plant today puts more in your bin at harvest. Harvest International, planting the future. Invisible, invasive, underestimated, nematodes are stealing over 10% of yields, and current protection methods aren't enough. But a breakthrough seed treatment technology controls nematodes when they attack. Now offering Nemastrike technology. It provides broad spectrum control from the start and stays in the root zone as plants grow. Take back your bushels with Nemastrike technology. Strike where nematodes attack. Let's take a look at our picks for the championship season. We've got 10-34-0. No, no, no. I don't want to talk about them. I want to talk about this agro liquid team. Take a look at this lineup. They got it all. The talent, their players can meet any challenge on any field. The coaching staff, the best I've seen. So that's your pick? No discussions? Nope. Agro liquid is the team. They're going all the way to the championship. <laughs> One of the largest and ugliest bugs that we ever find on our farm is the white grub. We'll talk about that and how you get it under control, where you're going to find it on your farm. Okay, first of all, there are many different types of white grubs. I don't really care what it is. If it's an annual grub, if it's what they call the true white grub that often can live three years or more, doesn't matter to me. We've got a problem. If you see white grubs out there, they can really attack your crop. Uh, a lot of times we do find it in corn, but it could be in soybeans or any crop. Where we most commonly find white grubs is near shelter belts. These grubs seem to like willows and a number of other types of trees, so you usually find it there. The other thing is since the true white grub can survive for more than just one year, if you've had a problem in the past in a field, it's probably going to be an issue again for another year or two or three years. So you want to make sure that you're treating this each time you're seeing a big problem. But the whole issue with that is this. There's no real great rescue option for white grubs. You have to do something at planting time. All right, here's the other thing, Brian, is there's a lot of information out there saying, well, white grubs are really only a problem in corn. Well, they are a problem in corn, but they're also a problem in other crops too. I remember reading something that came out from a, a university that said, yep, they're rarely if ever a problem in soybeans. And I was out visiting a farmer who had a white grub issue and was going to have to replant his soybeans because the grubs were so bad. And I remember printing out that article and heading out to his farm and I said, well, hey, according to this university, you don't have a problem with white grubs, but every shovel that we flipped over in his field had at least one white grub, if not more in it. So they can be a problem in multiple crops. All right, here's the great thing though. When you see adults, like let's say it's Japanese beetles or any type of beetle, some people call them June beetles. You see any of these great big beetles, you've got to kill them. 
Okay, you, you can't be thinking, well, I don't know if I'm at the economic threshold. No, you see some beetles out there, you go kill them. They're usually going to be, like I say, near shelter belts. They're just in areas in fields many times, so it's not like you have to spray the whole field. And you can spray them and kill them for 2 to $4 an acre. So it's no big deal, but if you can kill them right away when you see them, then they don't get the chance to reproduce, and you don't have the actual white grub, that worm, in your field next year. So get the adults under control, then you've got this thing taken care of. If you have to treat for white grubs, you could use one of the insecticides, Force, Aztec, uh, maybe it's Lorsban or Capture LFR, something like that. But just understand, these bugs are huge. So to think you're going to get 100% control with a normal insecticide rate, it's probably not going to happen. That's why you got to thin that population out when you see them the year before in the adult stage. And definitely don't count on your neonic seed treatments having a big impact on white grubs. Even at the really high rate, the 1250 rate, you're just not going to get grub control. So I agree with Brian. I like the insecticide, but I would focus it in furrow. You're not normally going to see the white grubs come up to the surface. They're going to be underneath. And then do some digging out in your field. See what you see for bugs. If you're still seeing some grubs out there, you may have to get even more aggressive. Okay, when Darren says more aggressive, again, no rescue treatment. You've got to get that grub at planting time. So that's why we'd like to get the adult stage during the season. If you see adults, you know you had grub damage early on too. Well, I wish white grubs just fed on our weed of the week. That would really solve a lot of problems for us. We'll show you what will stop this weed coming up next. The Weed of the Week is brought to you by Corteva AgriScience, Agriculture Division of Dow DuPont. Finish the fight against tough weeds with the Enlist Weed Control System. Weeds are tough. But we're tougher. With unrivaled weed control. Reduced drift. And near zero volatility. So, who's tough now? <laughs> Our weed of the week is bristly foxtail. This is a warm season annual grass, meaning it's gonna come on a little bit later in the season. So we have had some trouble with some of the pre-emerge herbicides doing a great job if they're used at a cut rate. And I think we're asking too much of our product sometime when we've got a, a weed that looks like green foxtail out there, although the seed head is gonna be a little more sticky. It's gonna catch on your fabric and that kind of thing, but it pops up a little bit later. So if we're using a cut rate, don't expect great control. But the good news is it does pop up later. So if you have a great crop canopy, especially early on, you're usually in pretty good shape with this weed. Like in wheat, for example, yes, you could use prepare, you could follow post-emerge with axial, but a lot of times just wheat alone, because that thick stand you usually have, that's enough to choke it out. In corn, I like a full rate to one of the grass killers like Harness, Surpass, Dual, Outlook, Zidua. If we get that down, we can come back. Post-emerge, if you've got Roundup Ready corn, I like even a lower rate of Roundup doing a pretty nice job on this weed. Yep, otherwise in conventional corn, we're talking accent. Turning to soybeans, just get one of the yellows down, follow post-emerge with one of the good grass killers we've got. There are plenty of them out there like Select, Fusillade, you name it, should wipe this thing out. That's all the time we have for our Weed of the Week Bristly Foxtail, but Iron Talk is coming up next. What do the top growers in the world have in common? If you had some insight into their strategies, would that help guide you moving forward? I'm Darren Hefty with Ag PhD. On Tuesday, February 19th, we'll be holding a free Secrets of High Yield Fields workshop on our farm near Baltic, South Dakota. We'll show you soil tests from some of the highest yielding fields in the world, compare them to farm averages in your area, and discuss which strategies will benefit you most. Attend the Ag PhD Secrets of High Yield Fields workshop. Register today at agphd.com. 
At Estes Performance Concaves, we know how valuable your time is at harvest. That's why we designed the new XPR Concave System. The XPR System is the number one performance concave system on the market, surpassing the rest in both speed and efficiency, ensuring every last grain from your field gets into your tank. Plus, XPR Concaves work for all row crops. No more changing concaves, meaning you have less downtime. Take back your bushels this harvest. Get Estes Performance Concaves in your combine today. Out here, great yield starts with great weed control. That's why I choose the Roundup Ready Extend crop system, the system that makes the difference. Because only I know what it takes out here. Yield's what it's all for. But keeping my fields clean all season, that's what it's all about. This is my field. Farmers across the country have put their confidence in the Roundup Ready Extend crop system. These are their experiences. The RR2X soybeans have really met our yield expectations. We used to be 45 to 50 bushels. Now we're setting a bar at 60, 70 bushels. We sprayed our field correctly, and we're keeping that money in the field. In 2019, we definitely will be 100% Roundup Ready to extend soybeans. Iron Talk is brought to you by Case IH. There are 6,272,640 square inches in an acre. We count it. Why? Because we designed the Tiger Mate 255 field cultivator and 2000 series early riser planter to maximize every single one. So when you create the most level seed bed in the industry and target a nickel size area to plant a seed and never miss, you'll know in high efficiency farming, there's one name to count on. Case IH. Rethink productivity. Learn more at caseih.com slash every inch. Are you using static electricity to your advantage on your farm? I'll explain in today's Iron Talk. Do you use a dry seed treatment of any kind, inoculant, a biological product, even talc or graphite? Have you ever considered what helps those dry seed treatments and flow aids stick to your seed? It's static electricity. If you've noticed dry products ending up at the bottom of your seed boxes or blowing out with your air seeder or planter, it's due in part to the loss of static cling. If you'd like your dry products to actually stick to the seed, here's how you do it. First, let's look at the old way of doing things. If you dump dry products onto the seed and then spread them out with a broomstick or some other tool, it can work if you do it right. Rather than dumping your dry seed treatment all in one lump in the middle of the box, though, spread it out thinly around your box. By dumping it in one lump, the seed treatment actually uses up its static electricity to stick together. When you break up the clump, a good share of the seed treatment just doesn't have enough static cling left to stick to the seed, and it ends up at the bottom of your box. By spreading it out right from the beginning, the static can attract right to the seed. A better way to do all of this, though, is to eliminate the clumping and maintain all the static electricity needed to attach the dry treatment to your seed. Automate the process. We've used a CT applicator for two main reasons. First, it uses a patented sifter to break up the clumps and provide an even application of dry products to the seed. Second, unlike other treaters, CT uses a stainless steel vessel which doesn't remove the static charge like polytanks will. The result is an even distribution and less treatment that ends up at the bottom of your seed hopper or blowing out with your air system. So remember, static electricity can be your friend with dry seed treatments. That's all for today's Iron Talk, and now, back to the show. As we wrap up our show today, I want to encourage you to check out the Ag PhD radio show. We're on each weekday on Sirius XM Channel 147 at 2 p.m. Central. And don't miss the next Ag PhD TV show. We'll have another Read of the Week, Farm Basics, Iron Talk, and a whole lot more. I'm Darren Hefty. And I'm Brian Hefty. Thanks for watching Ag PhD.